Okay, so how is everyone today? Pretty good. I got something in my, I got an eyelash in my eye just now. Or something. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> so, today's the... No, that, that means something astronomically, right? The 21st of September? That's a, that's a, what day is that? It's the, the equinox. It, yeah, this is the first day of fall. Well, oh, it, either that or it's the last day of summer, right? So it just depends. It's going to fall very, fall. <laughs> very near September 21. <laughs> Okay, so we've talked about we've talked about the multiplication function, the function that takes two arguments, a natural and a real, and produces a real. So we've 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 come up with two different ways. Uh, to do this, one of them is kind of in the the trivial way or the the sort of grade school way, and that is that we could define <coughs> the product, the multiplication of natural n and real x as uh, zero when n is zero, and then the very first one that we did, we said, well. Uh, we could we could say that it's uh, x plus the product of n minus one and x other ones. And what this is what this one is doing conceptually conceptually it's saying something like it's saying something like that the product of five and x is being construed as exactly x plus x plus x plus x plus x. Okay? So that was the first, the first uh, multiplication function that we did. But what, what was the sort of upgrade that we did for it? Right. The one that, the one that does even in odd cases. Okay. So the second way that we def oops, I was writing a two because I had two on the brain, I guess. The second way that we implemented it is we said that the product of n and x will now have three cases. Uh, it's still zero when n is zero. But now instead of having one case, now we have two cases, depending on whether or not n is even and not zero, or if n is odd. So in the case that n is even, in the case that n is even, we recurse back to, to the multiplication function, but with new arguments. What arguments? n over 2 and 2x in the case that n is even. So now, this is, a, this is a multiplication function. So in that sense, we're saying that multiplication is not defined except inside of this function, right? So then, so then strictly speaking, we don't have a way to do 5 times x inside of this function. So why, why is it legitimate for us to use the mul multiplication by 2, e even though our, our function is allegedly mul defining multiplication? Because you can't use the definition of multiplication <laughs> while you're defining it, right? That would cause a circularity problem. So why is it permissible for us to, to multiply by 2? Why are we construing that as being OK? Yeah? Because we know what adding is. OK. Because you could, you could look at it as just x plus x, right, for one thing. So you could say, well, it's not even a multiplication. It's actually, that's just uh, that's just a shorthand for x plus x, so, because we're assuming that addition works. 
But even still, I claim that multiplication by two is legitimate. Why is multiplication by two legitimate here? Yeah? Because the binary where it's really easy to do so. Right. Right. Because remember that the machine represents these numbers in binary. In binary. And for example, in, uh, because we have 10 fingers, all, all humans count in base 10. And what's the easiest number, besides 1 and 0, <laughs> what's the easiest number to multiply by in base 10? 10, right? Because that's just moving the point. So multiplying by 2 for the machine is the easiest possible thing because that's just moving the point. Okay, and, and, and that's what machines actually do. They have a specialized operation that multiplies by 2, and it's called a shift. So, so I, for that reason, I claim this is legitimate. Okay. Uh, then we, the, the last case is we need to consider is when n is odd. Okay, then, what, then what's the trick here? Yeah, you, you take out one of the x's. So, for example, if we wanted to compute 37x, then we'd say, well, that's actually x plus 36x. Okay, then conceptually, conceptually what this one is saying, it's saying something like, well, 100x, we're, we're going to uh, consider this to be 64x's, because 64 is a power of 2. And then what's the next power of 2x's that we'll need? 32 of them, right? That would give us 96x's. And then what's the next power of 2 that we need? 4. So what I want you to see about this is that um, if we had done 100x with the old style, we would have to have written 99 pluses, right? But with this, with this new style, uh, this is sufficient, okay, with three pluses. So that, that's the reason to do it this way is because it, 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 it occurs significantly faster. Okay, but now we're going to, we're going to have even another kind of multiplication, uh, but this one is totally easy. What we want now is we want a multiplication function that has this signature, multiplication from the integers across the reals to the reals. So what, what, how is that different than before? Yeah, we can, we can have, the, it, now we're going to per, permit n to be negative. But this is actually really easy. So can someone come up with, with a definition for this? So I'll give you a, a hint. It can be exactly the same as this one, except you need one more clause. What can you do? Yes? You could put if uh, the first argument is negative, you just put a negative around the whole thing. OK. You make the first argument positive. OK. So. How about, uh, how about this, that uh, the multiplication of n and x is, well, surely it's the multiplication of, say, uh, so in the case that n is negative, so we'll need to recurse to a positive n. So what positive n will we recurse to? Negative n, right? Is it possible for negative n to be positive? Yes. Yeah, right? When n is negative 10, for example, negative, negative 10 is positive. So we'll recurse to negative n and x. So that'd be good. That's good. Because then, then negative n will be natural. But then to, to handle the fact that we negated n, what, what else was, must we do? Sorry? Maybe more like that. Yeah? Like you said that the answer after that will be negative. Okay, so you're saying negate negate this. Yeah. Whatever this one gives back, negate yeah. it. Okay, I like it. 
So add this clause, okay, then zero, if n is zero, and then, you know, you can either do it the, 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 the grade school way or the even odd cleverer way after that, right? So you just have to add this one new clause, okay, then this is now the same as above. So what that's saying, what that's saying uh, is that, uh, for example, negative uh, 50x, negative 50 times x would be construed as, well, we'll negate and then do it with 50. So what's the greatest power of 2 less than 50, less or equal to 50? 32, so this would be, so this one conceptually is saying, 30, it, supposing that this is the even odd clauses are here. 32 x's, what's the next power of 2 that we can fit in? 16 x's. And then what's the next power of 2 that we can fit in? 2 x's. And then that's it. Okay, interesting. So now we have a method to multiply by any integer. Whereas before we had only, it, it was only capable of multiplying by naturals. Okay. So, uh, good. Any question about this? This is okay? Okay. So now, strictly speaking, calculus is not a prerequisite for this course. But we're going to add in just a little bit of calculus uh, for just a moment and then... I just need one little idea, and then we'll uh, safely exit to, to the topic. So in calculus, there are um, two points of, there's kind of two major points of view that you want to get across in calculus. Uh, one of them is that uh, Functions which are smooth, for a certain definition of smooth, uh, that is to say, you can think of it like curves that you can draw without picking up your pencil, and it doesn't get sharp anywhere, like a corner, like absolute value is sharp. So if it's smooth, if you could draw a smooth uh, curve, like so, So smooth like that, but, but not like this. That's pointy. If you were at this input right here, at input C, then this output would be right here. And if, that's, if this is function f, then that would be uh, f of c. And one of the points of view of calculus is that if you were on this curve and you were a little, little creature, very small in comparison to this curve, then it would look flat to you in the same sense that uh, if you're out in the middle of Kansas, then it looks flat. It does. The Earth does look flat to us. So that's what, that's what many folks used to think, and that's not really, that's not really that bad of, of an idea for folks that were of that time, right? They didn't, they, they couldn't go to space like we can and just see it as a matter of fact, okay? So if you were really, really small, if you were really, really small, then you would not be able to tell the difference between the red curve and the blue curve right there at that point. Okay? They're, they're identical. So uh, they're functionally identical to you if you're really small. So what's the name for this blue one? This is the tangent line. Uh, line has an I in it. Line. So that's the tangent line. So a significant part of calculus is 
uh, is the understanding that, that, that locally smooth things look flat <coughs> and uh, you want to compute equations for, for this particular line. Okay, and the name, of the, the name of what tells you the slope of the tangent line is called what? The derivative. The der derivative. So this, uh, this has slope Uh, which in calculus speak is written f prime of c. Okay, so it's not really relevant what, how to compute derivatives for, for the rest of the lecture. Just suffice it to say that if I, w if, if I were to give you a formula for a function, then by the time you've been in calculus for about four weeks, you'd be able to compute the derivative of that function. Okay, so <clears throat> locally smooth functions look flat. So here's the idea that we want to want to get to. Is we want to be able to solve equations in the following kind of way. So, <clears throat> suppose that this is f now. And what we want to do is we want to solve the equation f of x is equal to 0. Now, because I, because I drew a picture for you, and because you're a human being, you can tell me exactly where the solution is to this. So where's the solution to f of x equal to 0? Right there, right? So that, that's what we want. So we want this. That point right there. In particular, we want the x value that would, 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 such that when you plug it into f, you'd get 0. Okay, and we want to know how to do this, so humans have all manner of uh, very complicated and, and powerful image processing to just look at this and say, it's right there. But now that you've had some experience with MATLAB and under, understand that it's going to do exactly what you say and nothing else, now we need to figure out how to get MATLAB to do that, right? <laughs> how, how, can you con how can you convince MATLAB to do it? Okay. Well, here's the idea. Suppose that uh, we don't know, we don't know where that, where that value is. But suppose that we have a guess, okay, that, that we can guess where it is. Suppose that we guess and for sake of argument that we guessed uh, too big, like right here. So there's our guess. Now what we want, we want a way to take our guess and turn it into a better, a, a better candidate. Okay, because if, if for any guess, we were, we were able to turn that guess into a better guess, with one step, that means with ten steps we could get closer and closer and closer and closer. Okay, so, so, if we were to plug in this value right here, we'd get, this input would give us this output and we'd observe that output is positive. So, so that, that's, not the, that's not the solution. And now, I'm going to draw the tangent line to that point right there. So that's the tangent line. And can someone tell us a point that's, that's an even better guess than the one we started with? 
where the, where the tangent line crosses the axis. So this is our guess. This is our guess. And this one is ho hopefully now. There, there's, there's a bit, there's, there's a lot of things I'm glossing over. So this is hopefully better. So we want to solve where the tangent line crosses the axis. But then you might object and say, well, the tangent line is the blue function. The tangent line is the blue function and the red function is, is f. And if we, can solve, if we can solve the tangent line equal to 0, then why can't we just solve the red line equal to 0? It's because the tangent's linear. It's because the tangent is linear, right? So because, because the tangent line is linear, that means that algebraically it's quite easy to do that. Okay. So because the tangent is linear, it's easy to solve. for, and I'm just going to write this in scare quotes here, for tangent <laughs> equal zero. It's easy to find that one. So now suppose that, w suppose that we do that, that we come up with a guess, and then in some manner we construct the tangent line and then solve the tangent line equal to zero, and we get this point. Then how could we get even closer? by doing it again, right? We can do it again and again and again and again until we notice that we're not moving much anymore. So we keep, we keep coming back to the same point. Okay, so this, this technique is, um, is quite, quite old and famous and has a famous name. So what's its name? This is Newton's method. This is Newton's method. But in the, in the end, all that it is, all that Newton's method is, is you want to solve a nonlinear equation. You want to find where a curvy thing, you want to find where a curvy thing crosses the axis. That's hard. So what you're doing is you're substituting the problem. You're saying, well, I, I don't know. I don't like curvy things. So here at this point, I'm going to make a flat thing. And then I'm going to solve the flat thing equal to 0. I'm going to do that instead because linear equations are easy to solve. And then you'll do it over and over and over again. That's Newton's method. OK, so now let's work out the details. So this is the point. So now I need to make a new drawing, because otherwise that one will be too cluttered. So if this is input C, and that's function f of x, uh, so this is f. then what is this value? F of C, right? <coughs> Which is to say that the coordinates of that point right there are C, F of C. Okay, then the tangent line is passing through here. And the calculus result that I'm just quoting and not really getting deeply into, uh, the, t the tangent line has slope f prime at c, whatever that means. OK? 
Okay, so then now, can we find the equation of the tangent line? Suppose, be, so what's the name I'm, to find the equation of a line supposing you have a, a point and a slope? The point-slope formula, because mathematicians are going to name things like that, right? <laughs> unless, unless it's named after a famous person, then we call it the famous person's name. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> yeah, well, okay. <laughs> so the point-slope formula is y minus y naught is m x minus x naught. And so now it's just a matter of plugging in all the bits that we know. <coughs> okay. So, um, so uh, it becomes y minus uh, f of c is equal to f prime of c times x minus c. So that's the equation of this line. That's the equation of this line. So this is the equation of the tangent line. And what is it that we wanted to do with that line? Find when the tangent line hits the x-axis. And what, what will be true on the x-axis? Y, y will be zero. OK, so now uh, solve <coughs> when, when has an h in it. Solve when y is 0. Uh, and specifically, we want to solve for x, right? Solve when y is 0. <coughs> so that gives us negative f of c is f prime of c multiplied by x minus c. And we want to solve for x. So the first thing to do is divide by the derivative, notably, notably what is necessarily going to need to be true about the derivative has to be non-zero, okay? Uh, that would, that's saying that, that if, it ever ha if it ever so happens that the derivative, that the tangent line is horizontal, then Newton's method simply will not work because the tangent line's never going to end up crossing the axis. Okay, but that's, that's a point that we're going to sort of omit for now. Over f prime of c is x minus c. OK, then we can move the c to the other side and solve for x. So I'll do that and also reflect the equation to get uh, c minus f of c over f prime of c. Interesting. So what this is saying, algebraically now, algebraically now, is that uh, this point is our guess and this is better. So in the equation, so what in the picture, what is that point right there? It, so we have, we have algebra here. What's the name of that point? It's x. It's this one. So uh, this one is the guess. And this one is better. OK. <clears throat> so now, we know what Newton's method is. And what we want, and what we're set up for, is the following. Is this question. How does a calculator, or a machine generally, compute the square root of x? How does it do it? Right? So we, we can all just sort of quote a whole bunch of square roots. For example, what's the square root of 16? 
for okay fine so then when you when you type that into the machine it might not be too surprising that it responds with four because you can respond with four okay but what's the square root of ten mm, uh, <laughs> lots of mumbling right <laughs> but the calculator will not hesitate it just says well it's approximately this much. How is it doing that? Yes? Is it because it's using Newton's method? It's using Newton's method. So now let's see exactly what it's doing. Let, let's, let's work out exactly the, the, the technique that, that this calculator is using. So it, it, it does it in the, in the blink of an eye. It performs about mm, maybe five steps uh, altogether. So how does it do it? Okay. <coughs> So, uh, we want to uh, consider the following. So, let, so, how am I trying to say this? Suppose we want to compute x is the square root of b, where in the calculator, I just, b was 10. Suppose we want to do this. So, so, this x equal to square root of b uh, is equivalent, is equivalent to the equation x squared is b, moving the radical to the other side. Uh, and then <coughs> this, it, that equation is in turn equivalent to x squared uh, minus b is equal to zero. So in a sense, we want to solve, so we need to solve f of x equal to zero where f of x is x squared minus b. So if we could do that, if we could do that, then we would have the answer to what's the square root of b. Because that would, that would answer what would you need to square so that when you subtract b, you get 0. That, the answer to that question is the square root of b. OK. So conveniently, we have a method to solve such, such nonlinear equations now, Newton's method. And remember, all that Newton's method is, it is saying, it is sort of the admission that solving nonlinear equations is, di is difficult, so we're going to substitute that problem with a linear problem over and over again. Okay, so now for those of you who have taken calculus, uh, if, if f of x is uh, x squared minus b, then please tell me now, what is the derivative of f? 2x, for reasons that, if you haven't taken calculus yet, are just, they're, they're certainly relevant for math majors, but not relevant here. Suppose that, that I'm just not lying to you that it's 2x. So um, <clears throat> suppose that we have a guess. Suppose that our guess uh, is c. We have a guess for the square root, and our guess is c. Then now, let's use, let's use Newton's method from the previous page uh, and write down what the updated value would be. So there it is. So our next guess would be x is equal to uh, c minus f of c over the derivative of f at c. But now let's plug all the things in that we know and let's simplify it as much as possible. So c. So then in the first place, what is f of c? c, c squared minus b. And then what is f prime of c? 
It's uh, uh, sorry, I lost my. It's two C. Okay. <laughs> Brain was not cooperating there for a second. Okay, and what we want to do is simplify this formula as much as possible. <coughs> okay, so let's start out by uh, how about getting a common denominator? Okay, let's get a common denominator. Well, 2c over 2c, right? Because its denominator is 1. So that would give us 2c squared and then minus c squared minus b over 2c. <coughs> then uh, I'll simplify the numerator a little bit. Uh, so 2c squared minus 1c squared is c squared, and then minus negative b is add b, and then over 2c. And now I'm going to divide this c in, into the numerator. So it's currently in the denominator, but I'm going to divide it into each term in the numerator to get what? C plus B over C is the numerator, and then over 2. OK, so now let's think about this for a moment. Let's think about this for a moment. Remember, B is the number that we're trying to compute the square root of. So for sake of concreteness, let's say that we're trying to compute the square root of 10. And we know for a fact that the square root of 10 is between 3 and 4. Now, I want you to suppose that we have guessed that the square root is 4, which is, which, so that's our guess. And is our guess too big or too small? It's, it's too big. Our guess is too big. So that means that because our guess is too big, that's more than the true square root. This one is more. How about this one? It's going to be less. This one's going to be less than the true square root. So what this, is yeah, what this is saying is that this one is too big uh, and this one is too small, right? My porridge is too hot, my porridge is too cold. Well, let's average them together, right? That's what this is saying. Suppose, su <laughs> suppose that our guess is too small, okay? That we want to compute the square root of 10 and that we have guessed 3, which is too small. Then that would mean that this is too small. How about 10 over 3? That's too big. Okay? So, so again, we would be averaging something that's a little bigger and something that's a little smaller, and we'd be getting something in the middle. Okay, finally, what if, we, what if, what if our guess was exactly the square root, unbeknownst to us, our guess was exactly the square root of 10? Then, then this would be exactly right, and what is 10 divided by the square root of 10? The square root of 10. So this would be 2 square root of 10 over 2. So it would be exactly right. So this formula actually is old and predates Newton's method by millennia. What's its name? Does anyone know its name? It, it's obvious to us in retrospect. But to those folks at millennia ago, you know, it was pretty clever. <laughs> this, this is called the Babylonian method. Babylonian method. Did they have the same problem? Was they, were they trying to solve the same thing? They wanted to, they wanted to compute square roots, yeah. Okay, so let's, let's see this in practice for a moment. What time is it? We're doing good. Uh, it's called the Babylonian method to, to, to mathematicians because, because we really, you know, for some reason care about the historicity of it all. But in, the, in, the, in, in engineering circles, this is also called the uh, divide and average formula. 
it's called divide and average because you're taking uh, you're taking the number you want to compute the square root of you're dividing it by your guess and then averaging it with your guess so it's called the divide and average method it's a good name yeah okay so let let's try it out So, example, let's compute the square root of 10. Let's compute the square root of 10. So that's what we want to do. And, I, I, and I'm going to start with the guess, with guess uh, equal to 1. Surely that's not right, but that's, that's where I'm going to start. So our guess is... Uh, it's going to be called C, and then our the 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 improvement will will name X. So if we start out with C as one, we start out with C as one. I'll use the calculator here to do it. Oops. Then the update is five and a half. So that, that doesn't look like that's so great, right? One is not nearly the square root of 10 and neither is five and a half. But it's technically closer. But, but maybe we're getting better, right? So now, th what's the current guess? 5.5. So supposing we use that as the current guess. The update is, according to my calculator, uh, to three places, 3.659. Okay, so that, that's a better guess. Uh, now the current guess is 3.659. And if you plug that into the divide and average formula, then you get 3.196 And remember, the true square root is about 3.16, the, the true answer. So 3.196 is the current guess. And so the updated guess will be 3.162. Okay, so on the calculator, that's what it reads. So 3.162455 blah, blah, blah. And suppose I, I, I do it one more time. Okay, so, so it, it's unchanged to three places. So because we were only tracking places, that, that is in a sense meaning that we, we made it to the end. But if I press it one more time, I don't think the digits will, will change. Oh, the last one changed. Okay, now it won't change anymore. That's it. It has made it. Okay, to, to the precision available in this calculator. Interesting. So, so that means that, uh, you know, as, as I claimed, in about four or five steps, the calculator is able to do it. For those of you that were looking at the formula that I wrote in the calculator, what I did is I took the calculator and I typed 1 and hit enter. And the reason for doing that is, it, what, is that my calculator stores that in a variable called ANS, just like... MATLAB. And then I repeatedly, then I typed in the formula uh, ANS plus 10 over ANS and then over 2. So I typed that and just kept pressing enter. Okay. Wow. Yes? Um, how does the computer determine the value for C for the first guess? This is a good question, and in the end, the, the majority of, of, of guesses are just one. So, so what's the computer's guess for the square root of 100? One. one. What's the, <laughs> the first guess? What's the computer's first guess for the square root of a million? One. One. <laughs> okay, now, there are some, some computers try to be a little more clever about it. Uh, to say, well, if it's really big, then maybe we won't guess one, maybe we'll guess, you know, 100 or something. But for our purposes, we will all, our first guess will always be one. And when does it know uh, when to stop? 
Uh, we, now, now we have to get there, right? Yes. Yes. So, so let let's do that to to uh, to relieve your concern. So, how about say the square root of even something that we know? What's the square root of zero point two five? Zero point five, right? The square root of a fourth is a half. So, supposing that we do this, supposing that I do, I just do it in the calculator for you real quick. So we want to compute the square root of that. Okay, so then here's what the calculator will do. So 0 0.25 is the first guess. The next guess is 20. <laughs> Terrible. Uh, then 10. Then that, that. Did I not type it in correctly? No, I, I'm doing it with 10. <laughs> Never mind. Just a second. Sorry. Ignore that. Should have known something was wrong there. So what happened is I, I left I left that as ten, but that needs to be zero point two five. Uh, yeah. Okay. So the first guess is zero point is, is just a second. The first guess is one. Then the next guess will be zero point six two five. Then zero point five one two five. 0.5-ish. There it is. So it, it, it works for, for anything except except zero. That won't work for this one. For the for the for the Babylonian method. But 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 luckily we can do that as a special case because I imagine that you could tell me right now what the square root of zero is. Yeah. Zero. <laughs> yes? For uh, the calculator it looked like it was just going in deeper and deeper. Mm -hmm. Does it ever necessarily get the actual thing, or does it just run when it gets to so close that it doesn't matter? Well, uh, it, it couldn't possibly get, say, to the square root of 3, because uh, those numbers are stored with just a finite number of bits. Yeah. But for the 0.5, it looked like it was getting 0.5000000. 0, 0, 0, 0, 0. So is it just getting so close that the calculator can't even calculate the difference? Essentially. Okay. So, so that that's a matter for that I'm going to ignore a little bit uh, because in numerical analysis you you study well just exactly how does how does the machine store a floating point number uh, something that we're we're currently treating as if it's a real number um, how does the computer store that uh, and the answer is well it it rounds in a lot of different ways and places and and some and for some applications it can be quite important <laughs> just exactly what the machine's doing but i'm ignoring it okay so now we want a function that will compute <coughs> square roots we want a function that will compute square roots so <coughs> suppose that suppose that we want to compute the square root of B. So the square root of B is going to be defined as, uh, well, what do we want to call, what do we want to call it? The Babylonian method? Let's call it the Babylonian method since this is a math class. So it'll be the Babylonian method to compute the square root of B and then the first the, 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 the first argument will be what we're trying to compute the square root of, and the second argument will be the, the first guess. So what's the first guess? One. Well, and we're going to need one more parameter to, to address his concern. And that is we want to compute the square root of b to within epsilon. So we'll stop. We'll stop when, when the, the when the updated guess is within epsilon of our, of our current guess. Okay. So the initial guess is one. So this would give us the square root of b to within 
within epsilon. Okay, so now we need to define the capital B function. So we want to compute the square root of little b to within epsilon, and the current guess is uh, c. Okay. <clears throat> so in the first place, we need a special case to handle um, zero, because our the Babylonian method won't work for zero. But we we can still we can still do it, right? So what's the square root of zero? zero. So good. So the answer is zero, and then what's, what what's the condition to get into that clause when b is zero? Okay. <clears throat> so now what? So let, let's compute our update. So supposing that, supposing that we're not exiting in the zero clause, uh, let's compute our update. We'll compute x is that formula, the divide and average formula, the Babylonian formula, which is b plus b over c over 2. Yes, thank you. I, I, th I thought something was looking strange. Our guess plus that one over two. Okay, much better. So now, now we have this. Now we have our new guess. But we need to we need to ask ourselves: uh, Is this guess now? Is our new guess now so close to our previous guess that we should stop? Okay. So now we've calculated this. Now that we've calculated it, there's two more clauses. There's a clause that's going to say we're going to stop. And there's another clause, another clause which is saying we're not going to stop. We're going to keep going. Okay, so the stopping clause, the stopping clause. We'll say that the answer is x, to say that x is close enough. When, when do we stop and respond that the answer is this guess? It's not when x, it's when that, when what? Right. So when the difference between the guess, the, the guess that was plugged in, and the guess we just constructed is less than epsilon. So we're close enough. We're close enough. So this, this, is, this is saying that, well, zero is a special case. This one is saying we've made it far enough. And then now we need one more case, which is, which is the case that we haven't made it far enough. So, so what's the, what will we do? Right, it'll be when all of these are false, but what will the value be? Yes. Because what this is saying, we, we made a guess, but our guess wasn't close enough, so let's go back with the new guess. Okay. We'll say less. We'll say less. I don't think it makes much. It doesn't make any, hardly any difference in in the end. We'll say less. <clears throat> okay. Good. So let's try to compute a square root, and let's do it with with capital B and, and S, right? <laughs> so, for example, so com suppose that we want to compute the square root of what's the number we would be nice to compute the square root of. How about nice like 2370? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so then how, uh, how close do we want to make sure we get? Uh, well, yes, but g give me a specific epsilon, please. Zero, zero, one? Yeah. Zero, zero, one? Okay. Zero point zero, <laughs> zero, one? Like that? Okay, fine. Okay, so that means that when the third digit, when the third digit stops changing, we, we've done it. That's what it means. 
So this would mean, this would be the Babylonian method. Uh, and we want to compute the square root of 2370 to within epsilon. And what is our guess? One. <laughs> what a good guess. <laughs> okay, so supposing that we do all that. And we faithfully carry out the arithmetic. But the, the arithmetic's boring, so I'm just going to do it for us here. Okay, so then this would be uh, the Babylonian method. Well, we would calculate x. We would calculate x to be 1185.5. That's our value for x. And then we'd ask ourselves, is the difference between, 20, uh, between 1 and 1185.5 less than epsilon? It isn't, so we need to continue. Uh, so we'll continue with 1185.5. Okay, then supposing we, we, we calculate our, our new guess. Our new guess is 593.7-ish. Okay, so now the difference between these two numbers, 1,100-ish one, 1, uh, and 600-ish, is that less than epsilon? It is not. <coughs> So we must continue. Okay, so uh, we continue with this number, 593.7, etc. 0.749, blah, blah, blah. So calculate the next guess, 298.87. So now is the difference between these two numbers less than epsilon? No, we must continue. <clears throat> okay, so now the new guess. 153.400. Okay, not less than epsilon. Isn't this boring? <laughs> it is boring. But this is the thing, is that MATLAB doesn't care. <laughs> that this, this, in my opinion, is one of the reasons why we organized ourselves into societies, so that we could make machines do this for us. Okay. <laughs> that's the original Yeah, that's <laughs> In the end, that's it. <laughs> okay, so then, still not. I think we're getting close now. So, so my, the, the guess that I for, forgot to write down, the guess that we made was now 56.248-ish. So now the distance is only, it's less than 30 now uh, between those two. So the next guess is 49.19. So the distance is now around 7. Uh, the next guess is 48.685. So that distance is around what? Uh, so that's 48, a little bit more than 49, a little bit less than 49. So that's less than half now. The distance is less than half, but not less than our epsilon. Almost there. Ah, 
did we make it? Nope, one more after this. Uh, because the guess was 48 point six eight two. Six eight two. Right, we're almost, <laughs> this is 0 0.003. Okay. <laughs> no, after the society's comment, I've just been sitting here picturing a couple of hunter gatherers just sitting together being like, yo, but what if we could make a thing that did things? Yeah, exactly. Well, I mean, this is the story of, of human society, right? Okay, well, we did it to, to Epsilon 48.682. And if you're suspicious that this doesn't really sound all that excellent, well, 48.682 multiplied by 48.682. So there it is. I typed it in the machine, and it's going to respond with pretty close. Yeah. OK. And a relatively low number of steps, whatever yeah. it felt like. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, this seems this seems like a lot for for us, but for 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 MATLAB or the calculator, it does all these steps. It you know by the time you by the time you register the sensation of having the button clicked, <laughs> the machine is, has been finished for a long time. Okay, the the amount of time it takes the signal to travel up to your to your head. Okay, good. Any question about that? Okay. So now, in the divide and average formula, you've got to divide, right? <laughs> okay. And what were we dividing by? Were we dividing by two? We were dividing by two, so that, so that one, in a sense, is permissible, right? That one's okay. But notice also that we were dividing by C. And at least, strictly speaking, if we're trying to build up all of arithmetic from first principles, we don't know how to divide by C. We don't even know how to do it. Now, what does it even mean to do that? OK, so, so now what we have to do is we have to come up with a way to define division. And the only, the only things that we're going to be allowed to do is we're going to be able to add and subtract. Those, are, those will be permitted. And we'll be able to uh, divide and multiply, but only by two. <coughs> Well, no, we can multiply. We'll say that we can multiply by anything, but we can only divide by 2. OK, we're not allowed to divide by 3. That's not allowed. OK, so how can, we, how can we figure out how to do it? Well, again, it's Newton's method to the rescue. <coughs> so remark. How does the, the machine uh, perform division? How does it do it? So specifically, if you were to go to MATLAB and you were to say x is whatever number and then y is some other non-zero number, then you could type into MATLAB x divided by y, and it's going to do something. And it's predictable, and, it, and it's fast, and it works. How is it doing that? OK. So in the first place, <coughs> according to our math definitions, I'd like for you to observe that this is actually equal to, th that it is equivalent to, uh, x multiplied, multiplied by the reciprocal of y. So you could divide by y if you knew how to compute y's reciprocal, because x over y would be x multiplied by the reciprocal of y. So what I'm saying is that if we knew how to compute reciprocals, if we could this, if we could do that, then we could do that. So the first, the first question we're going to answer is, is how, do you, how do you compute a reciprocal? OK. <clears throat> so suppose uh, 
we want to compute 1 over b. So I'm using b because on the, on the previous thing it was the square root of b. Now, now we want to compute the reciprocal of b. Suppose we want this. Okay, uh, that would mean that we could say we want to solve. We want x is equal to uh, one over b. <clears throat> x is equal to one over b, and we want to solve this for x. We want to solve this for x. So I could move the. How do I want to do this? I'm gonna. I'm gonna. First, I'm going to reciprocate both sides so that it's 1 over x is b. So the reciprocal of b is, is an x such that 1 over x would be b. So now I'm going to move the b to the other side. So now this equation is nonlinear in x. It's nonlinear in x. And what we want to do is we want to solve f of x equal to 0 for f of x equal to the function 1 over x minus b. Okay. So, so what we're saying is we want to solve a nonlinear equation. We want to solve a nonlinear equation. And um, we can use Newton's method. So if f of x, I'm going to need two columns for this probably. So if f of x is this, then again, I'll ask for the aid of the calculus folks. Would you please tell me, what's the derivative of 1 over x minus b? Negative 1 over x squared. And again, that, that's, that's certainly true. I'm not misleading you, but it's just not relevant exactly why that is here and now. Suppose that, suppose that, this, is, that this is true. OK, then <clears throat> let's, let's uh, say that we have a C. So suppose that our guess is C. So we have some guess for the reciprocal of 1 over b, and our guess is c. Now I want to plug in to the, to the Newton's formula thing and, and simplify it. So Newton's formula says that, that the new guess, that the better guess, is the current guess minus the function evaluated at the current guess divided by the derivative evaluated at the current guess. That's, that's the, the formula. Just writing it down. So now let's plug in the things that we know. So x is c minus, and then the function is 1 over x minus b. Uh, one, thank you, 1 over c. 1 over c minus b, and then divided by uh, negative 1 over c squared. Okay, and what we want to do is we want to simplify that formula as much as possible. And in particular, there can't be any divisions unless, unless they be divisions by 2. And why can't there be any divisions? Because we haven't defined division yet, right? You can't, you can't define division in terms of division. OK, <clears throat> so we need to symbolically manipulate this a little bit. So for, first thing, I'll observe that, that that negative cancels with that negative, yeah? <clears throat> and furthermore, division by this fraction is the same as multiplication by its reciprocal. So <clears throat> this would be c and then plus c squared multiplied by 1 over c uh, minus b. So already that's looking pretty good because, well, no, it's not looking good yet because we still have a division. OK, so c can we get rid of that division? Yeah, by what? OK, distribute that in. OK. <clears throat> so x is c plus, and then distributing that in, uh, that'd be a c minus uh, 
C squared B. Okay, now uh, we can simplify this a little bit to get what? 2C uh, minus C squared B. And I'll, I'll factor out a C. So this will be, uh, is that right? Yeah. Looks like it. Yeah. I'm gonna think about it for just a second. Okay, so, so, so have a look at this formula. Does this formula use any divisions? It doesn't. So in particular, it uses two multiplies and one subtraction. Okay, so, so if you had a guess for the reciprocal of B, then you could get a better guess with two multiplies and one subtraction. You'd get a better guess. And then you could use that better guess to get a better guess, etc. So this formula is also uh, very famous and has its own name. So what's the name for this formula? Anyone? No takers. Okay, so it's less popular, than, le less, less in the popular mind than the Babylonian method. This is called the newton rapson Well, specifically, this is this is referred to as newton rapson division. Okay. Now here's here's some some bad news. So the Babylonian method, the Babylonian method. If you attempt to use the Babylonian method with input zero, and you don't have a special case where you're saying that oh, as a special case, I'm saying the square root of zero is zero, then that Babylonian function behaves quite badly if you plug in zero. Yeah. Well, this one, this one behaves quite badly all over the place, right? <laughs> so you're not able to, you're not able to, we won't be able to break it down to, to, to um, such, such simple matters. You know, you can't just say, well, I'm gonna make the guess always equal to one. Okay, this one is going to require having a, having a quite good first guess. You have to have a good one. Okay, and furthermore, furthermore, what we're going to have to do is we're going to have to say, we're only going to compute reciprocals between one half and one. So that is to say, we, we're not going to have any, at least at first, we're not going to have any way to compute the reciprocal of five. Because that's more than, that, that's not between half and one. And we're not going to have any way to compute the reciprocal of, say, a tenth, 0 0.1, because that's too small, right? We don't, we'll, only have this, we'll only have this sweet spot between half and one where we can actually do it. And then once we have that nailed down, then we'll be able to come up with a way to compute the, recip to, to compute the reciprocal of anything that we need. Just based, just based on that? Based on that. Okay. Just based on that. Gotcha. But we've run off the edge of the, of the clock. So we'll have to continue that next time.